chance to be able to, um, you see, why is this saying camera? Okay, don't worry. Um, I'm just gonna put my picture back up and we're gonna get started. Okay, let's see, this video is paused due to problems with your network. Jeez, what is going on? Is everybody with me? I am. As long as we have Catherine and you, uh, I guess we're yeah. all right. <laughs> we can do without me, you know, but we can't do without you two. <laughs> and I'm going to do, put Catherine, just you on the screen. That may make it easier for. Well, I love, you know, I love being able to see you guys. Um, one thing I discovered during the pandemic when I was really becoming like an expert in Zooming um, <laughs> was that, um, you know, I, I, I had done so many live events in my life and I suddenly was doing these Zoom events and people were politely muting themselves while I was talking, which was very nice of them, except that... Um, it meant that I was getting no auditory feedback. You know? Oh yeah. So I would like say a little joke and, and in a, in a live situation <laughs> that I would hear like a little, you know, rumble through the crowd of like a little chuckling. <laughs> Ooh, there's a thing. And, um, and, but then, but like, but all of a sudden doing zooms, I was just getting crickets, you know? And I was yeah. like, wow, nobody's having any fun. And then I, and, and you can like, you know, intellectually that people are laughing, like you can see them, you know? But also, you don't hear it, and you're and I didn't realize how dependent I was on that auditory feedback. And then it was like when it was gone, I was suddenly like, "This is very weird. Like I'm so disoriented." Um, and then a few years into the pandemic, a couple of years in, um, I did an event for my old college, actually the place where I did grad school, and they put they did an event where they had everyone mute themselves. And then also the way that they set it up, I could only see my own face. So that was like just talking into like the mirror. I mean, I basically just <laughs> been totally by myself. It was so weird. But that's we're said, not gonna do that. Um, that said, there was once a woman who, when I told everybody not to mute themselves, everybody was like, okay, cool. But then this woman's very nice husband showed up in the background of her little box and he was vacuuming. Oh, <laughs> and it was and so loud. And I, was like, I was like, oh, that's the sweetest husband in the world. He's vacuuming. I was like, but she also does need to mute. I was like, yeah, you're going to need to mute because that's very noisy. So well, it's here's, tricky. It's here's tricky. a funny story about the things you would see in the background. For those of you who just joined, I'm so sorry, but for whatever reason, my camera is not cooperating. So you're just going to have to hear my voice. But when I, Catherine, before I took this job as an innkeeper, I was an event producer. And we were able to very easily pivot to uh, Zoom to do events. Yeah. And we held a 50th reunion event because these people were like, I don't even know if I'm going to be alive tomorrow, much less a year from now. So we still want to have our reunion. Yeah. And the things that at that time, especially that older generation, understand that you could see everything. Yeah. So we saw couples fighting with each other. Um, one lady was totally in the dark. And so she looked like the Blair Witch Project with her, you know, with her face. And one lady got up and went to the bathroom and like took her phone with her. So we got to see oh. Oh, all of that until I finally realized what she was doing. And then I, I took her off camera. But I mean, it's just like, yeah. So I think that was pretty benign. I just got the vacuuming. Yeah, no, I mean, looking back, you've you've given it a whole new context. Yeah. Um, okay, so I'm going to get started, and I'm so happy you're here, Catherine. I know we asked you to join us when we read Things You Save in a Fire a few years ago, which we totally loved. And I think you were in the middle of trying to uh, reach a book, a deadline for another book you were writing. And, and so you're so gracious to join us because you have so many things in the works right now that we're going to talk about. So thank you so much for, for being here. Yeah. Um, I want to read um, a, um, a bio about you so that everybody kind of understands that you've been reading. I mean, you've been writing since you were in sixth grade. If y'all after the call, be sure to go over to mm -hmm. Catherine's website 
and read her darling, um, you know, kind of summary of herself, all her likes and dislikes, things she can and cannot do. But I want to, I'm going to read this. It says, book page calls Catherine Center the reigning queen of comfort reads. She's the New York Times bestselling author of eight books, including How to Walk Away, Things You Save in a Fire, uh, and What You Wish For. Her summer 2022 book is The Bodyguard, which we've read. Okay. The, the movie adaptation of her novel, The Lost Husband, starring Josh Duhamel, hit number one on Netflix. And her novel, Happiness for Beginners, is in production as a Netflix original movie starring, starring Ellie Kemper and Luke Grimes. Catherine writes love and cry books about how life knocks us down and how we get back up. She's been compared to both Jane Austen and Nora Ephron. And the Dallas Morning News calls her story satisfying in the most soul nourishing way. Her books have made countless best of lists, including Real Simple's Best Books of 2020, Amazon's Top 100 Books of 2019, Goodreads Best Books of the Year, the Indie Next Greed, Great Reads List, and many more. Catherine lives in her hometown of Houston with her husband, two kids, and their fluffy but fierce dog. So we're so happy to have you here. And um, as I said, you have been writing since you were in sixth grade. Your very first book was the, a Duran Duran fan girl book. <laughs> okay. So any Duran Duran fans out there, she could probably hook you up with knowing everything you need to know. Um, but tell us a little bit more about you. If people haven't had a chance to read about you, just, you know, how did you get yeah. into writing? How did you fall in love with this whole idea of being an author? So yeah, that, that, that fact about Duran Duran fan fiction is true. Um, when I was in the sixth grade, I was very, very awkward. Like I was just a disaster in the sixth grade. And I had, you know, braces top and bottom and huge buck teeth. And I had a terrible haircut and um, I had no fashion sense and I had long flat feet like snorkeling flippers and I was just, you know, I was just a disaster. And, and I knew that I was a disaster. You know, I think there are some lucky kids who kind of make it through middle school without ever sort of realizing like truly how bad it is. But I was not one of those kids like I knew, you know, and I just kind of, I just kind of walked around that whole year just like hunched over an apology like I'm sorry, you know, like I too wish this were not happening and I just didn't know how to fix it right I was very mean to myself as I think a lot of middle school girls are mm -hmm. and um my I was really lucky that year because we had two I had two best friends who were also awkward and also miserable and we got this idea that we should write novels about meeting this 1980s boy band right we should meet the band in our novels we should cast ourselves as the main character and we should basically write ourselves some wish fulfillment fiction right where our lives were glamorous and we were awesome and everything was okay and so we did we spent the whole school year with these little spiral notebooks and we would kind of write all week you know, kind of suffer through the school week. And then on the weekends, we would get together and we would have sleepovers at somebody's house. And we would, you know, put on our PJs and pile into somebody's bed and read our novels to each other, like in installments. I mean, that's what we did for fun. And it was, um, it was blissfully fun. You know, I mean, sixth grade was misery, but writing those novels was bliss. And, um, you know, it was, uh, I, you know, I will just honestly tell you like what happens in my Duran Duran 1980s fan fiction novel, which is that you end up getting married to one of the, the singers. Indeed. Uh, well, the <laughs> wedding didn't actually happen, but basically <laughs> um, they were driving through my neighborhood and this novel didn't really happen. And um, they got a flat tire in front of my house and then they needed to use the phone. And so they walked up, you know, it's the 1980s, no cell phones, right? They needed a landline to call a tire guy. So they walk up to the close front door, it just happens to be my front door. And I just happened to be home, you know, at the time watching MTV and busting my dance moves to their Hungry Like the Wolf <laughs> video. And so I hear the bell and I let them in, you know, I find these beautiful rockers on the front stoop and I let them in. And I let them use the phone and I make them uh, microwave popcorn because they have to wait oh, a little while for yeah. the tire guy to come. And he's like super busy that day and he can't get to us in a timely way. And so we wind up just kind of hanging out um, 
in my mom's living room making chit chat. And by the end of that, like one crazy afternoon, all five of them fell in love with me. And I had to, wow. that, was plot. that was the plot of the novel, right? I had, you to, had to navigate all those relationships. It was a lot. It was a lot. Um, but you know, it's hilarious. It's terrible, right? It's the worst novel ever written. Um, but it was also kind of, I mean, it was certainly the thing that got me hooked on fiction. It was certainly my first, um, taste of like this sort of power and magic of how fiction can save you, you know, and how stories can give you things to look forward to and change your mood and change your perspective and, you know, fill you up with hope and laughter and anticipation and all kinds of good things. And so, you know, it was, I didn't understand it then, and I certainly couldn't have put it into words, but whatever that was, like, I knew that it was really powerful. You know, I had that experience of like, that was the thing that lifted my little boat up in the water during that really tough year. Awkward time. And mm -hmm. I knew that it was, I knew whatever it was, it was like the closest thing to magic I'd ever encountered. And that was really it. I mean, that was the moment I was like, I want to do this. I want to figure out what this is and how it works and how to wield it. Mm -hmm. And so from then on, you know, I mean, I, everything that I did in life was somehow geared towards learning how to write and growing up to become a writer. So, you know, I mean, I can go through my whole, I can do the whole journey. I got no plans. You know, if y'all want to hear it, I will <laughs> tell you the entire thing. But, but that was definitely the beginning for sure. And I'm so glad that it started that way. So what was your very first book that you wrote where you actually like became a New York Times bestseller? Um, well, my very first book that I ever wrote that was published, uh -huh. um, was called The Bright Side of Disaster. And that came out in 2007, but I did not hit the New York Times bestseller list until 2018. So, okay. it was, you know, it was a good 10 plus years. Um, I wrote six novels. My sixth novel was How to Walk Away. And that okay. was first one to hit the New York Times list. So, you know, it was just kind of a slow burn. I was definitely not like an overnight sensation by any means. Well, but that's kind of how Jackie, um, she texted me and said how much she loved this book and called it a slow burn. I mean, that's kind of yes. how your journey to being an author. I, and yeah. so, so what do you say to people who want to be authors? Because it seems like that every single author we've had on here has written one book and all of a sudden it's, they're like, I have no idea why everybody loved this book. Mm. So what do you say yeah. to the author like yourself <laughs> who has had, you know, 10 plus years of books? Do yeah. You, how do you, how do you keep writing and not give up? So that has kind of been my, that's been my challenge, right? That's been sort of my journey was that I, I would have loved to have been an overnight sensation. I think everybody kind of hopes that that will happen, but that's like a lightning strike that really doesn't happen to very many people, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, so I had many, many years. I mean, what are we in now? It's 2023 and my first book came out in 2007. So it's been 16 years. Is that the math? Yeah. Um, and, you know, and and even after hitting the New York Times list, it was it's still been a process for me of just slowly finding the people out there who are going to like the thing that I do. Right. And the thing that I do is a little bit unique because it's not just it's not really straight women's fiction. And because it, it's a little more rom com -y than women's fiction, but it's not straight rom coms either because it's a little more sort of heartbreaking and there's a little bit more sort of what is the meaning of life. So I think of the books that I write as sort of half personal growth, right? And half love story. Mm -hmm. And the personal growth part is um, always that the main character has to go through something hard. You mm -hmm. know, the main character has to face some kind of struggle. And in during the course of the story, and I love making sure that that's in the story because that's where wisdom comes from. You know, right? You, you've you've been quoted as saying joy is as important as sorrow. Oh, absolutely, right? And 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 when you're struggling, that does that doesn't really feel like joy, right? So for me, the half of the book that's the joy is always the love story part of it because a love story has so much warm, positive, hopeful anticipation as you're moving towards 
this blissful moment when the two people sort of get through all their stuff and figure it out and you know fall into each other into each other's arms like i love that and that mm -hmm. for me that's very joyful love stories are very joyful and then i always make sure to have this other piece in there where the main character is having to go through something hard and i i don't love to torture the main characters but i do like to make them struggle because i really think that you can't figure out who you are or what really matters or why life is worth living, right? Or what you care about or what you value if you if you aren't challenged, right? If you don't have to go through hard stuff. That's that's those are the moments in life that make us grow and make us better people. So I, I do both, you know, I do both. So the way so I'm not answering your question though. What I what I have done in my life to get through this very, very long period of delayed gratification, where for many, many years I kept thinking I was going to have to quit. You know, my husband's a school teacher. I was raising little kids. I was writing books and trying to make it. You know, we were raising a family of four um, on one salary for a long time, because even after I started getting book deals, you're not getting a lot of money, you know, at the start, you have to work your way up, or at least I did. And um, so, you know, for a long time, I kept thinking I was going to have to quit. I was like, we're not making it. The air conditioner just broke in August and we had to replace it. And, you know, what am I, what are we, what am I going to do? How am I going to, how am I going to justify doing this thing that is not really contributing to the family finances? And my husband, fortunately, was just super supportive. And my mom, too, was super supportive. And they were both you know, they were like, what you're doing is really great and it's really special and you just have to keep trying and you have to not give up. So that was one part of it was that I had really supportive people around me who did not want me to stop. Mm -hmm. But the other thing that I really had to do, and this was a process, was I just decided that I was just going to double down on gratitude. Like that was mm -hmm. how I was going to get through it. I was going to be grateful that I got to do this at all. And even if every year i kind of thought it was the last year that i was going to get to do it before i'd have to quit and get a real job and um i was going to be grateful for that last year you know and i wasn't gonna look around and feel bitter that other people had gotten other things i was going to be grateful for what i got to do and what i got to do was every day i got to get up and think about stories and get lost in these fun stories and write all this great dialogue and hang out with these fun, goofy, lovable characters. And I was gonna be grateful for that. And even if it went away, even if I could never make it, I was going to be grateful that I ever got to do it at all. That's a that's such a great way of looking at it. It um, worked, it worked, it was good. It was a good policy and it actually, you know, getting good at doing that for my writing life helped me get good at doing that for life in general. So sure. it was actually really helpful. And I bet you were super grateful that Josh Duhamel uh, was in your book, um, The Lost Husband. I <laughs> was. <laughs> did you get to meet him? I did. I oh, did. Oh, my gosh. Love is Josh Duhamel. Uh, is he gorgeous in person as he is in on the screen? Let me let me answer that question. Mm. Uh, give me a second. So, uh when they filmed the movie, they filmed it in Texas, and they very kindly invited me to come to Austin, where they were filming this farmer's market scene in the movie, and come and be an extra at the farmer's market. So Ooh, they, okay. Yeah, so I got to go, and I got to take my mom, and I took my husband and my two kids, and we all drove to Austin, and we showed up at this farmer's market. And um, Josh Dumel was there, and he was so handsome y'all like mm. i can't even tell you he he sparkled he glowed like the handsomeness just like rose off of him like steam i've never seen anything like it you know every time i say that in front of my husband he's like except for me like obviously right. he's seen me <laughs> um but uh i've never seen anything like it i mean he was he's such a movie star you know what i mean yeah. he's like six five and Ugh. he's just sort of weird physical perfection and he came over to say hi to me because there I was, you know, and he, yeah. he knew that I had to book, even so. put a sentence together. Well, he came over to say hi and he was like, you know, it's nice to meet you. I hear you wrote the book. I'm Josh. And I did actually forget how to talk. Like he was so, <laughs> he was so handsome that the quadrant of my brain that makes words just closed right down. It just went. Yeah. And I just stood there gaping up at this man 
like a wide mouth bass, just with my mouth just opening and closing. <laughs> and and he was trying to make conversation with me. And he was not asking me hard questions. He was totally throwing me softball questions. It was like, so are you from Texas? Like, I know the answer to that question. We weren't doing calculus. Like, I know that question. But I couldn't make any words. It was so weird because talking is my favorite activity. And uh, I felt like a rotisserie chicken at the grocery store. Like, my skin got all hot and crackly. And I was, <laughs> just felt like I was kind of spinning around. I was like, what is happening? <laughs> Um, and yeah, I mean, by the end of the day, I mean, he was so nice and he was super friendly and in between takes, he would play songs for us on his phone. He was like, listen to this great song. And, uh, he was super sweet to my son and we, we just, he was really, really nice. But by the end of the day, I was just like, uh, this is so exhausting. Could we just get some normal men in here, please? Really? Yeah, we get some dorky guys? Yeah. Just a regular man is fine. Did he smell good? I did not get a chance to sniff him. Okay. Uh, <laughs> but you know, the visuals were really enough. I'd say that I'm was, sure it was very awesome. Creepy. Yeah. See, awesome. that's who I saw as the, this is always a question we ask who would play Jack and Hannah? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so I, I was thinking of Josh Jamel and probably cause I was mm -hmm. already kind of biased that he was in one of your other movies, but um, maybe he's a little too old for Jack. Uh, he would certainly do. I would never say no to him. I would also take a Hemsworth if necessary. Oh yes, Chris Hemsworth. But I think Ryan, Ryan Reynolds. Ryan Reynolds. Ryan Reynolds. Oh yeah. Oh. Would never say no to Ryan Reynolds. Absolutely. He he's himself. he's funny and he's charming and he's certainly handsome enough. Oh right. yeah. For but sure. then you he mentioned did. him in the back of the book, and that kind of yeah my, my picture of Ryan Reynolds because he was at the sitting wedding. at the wedding. <laughs> And who would play Hannah? You know, I, I'm. it's funny. I'm never very good at this game because even though it's a very fun game, because um, I'll take anybody, you know, like I'm so excited when the movies happen. I also know for real now that two of my books have been turned into movies that they don't ask me. Like they definitely yeah. do not call me, right? Like, like they've got casting agents for this kind of thing and they have their choices and it's made in higher levels than mine. But that said, I do love... I do love an actress who can sort of deliver lines in kind of a wry, deadpan kind of way. You know, I like I like people who are funny, and some people are just funnier than other people. Yeah. Um, so you know, I'm, but I'm not I'm not picky at all. Like I'll just take anybody who um, comes along who can who can do the role. Yeah, I'm not as I'm not into I'm not as into the younger actors lately. I mean, I don't know a lot of them. So um, okay, so moving on. Um, let's talk about the book, which yeah. was, you know, it's, it's a book that you can't wait to get your pajamas on and get into bed and read and just get lost. So I think definitely the queen of comfort reads. Mm, thank you. When was the, and I want y'all to, to jump in with questions too. Sure. When was the moment for Jack and Hannah that you feel like they fell in love? I think we saw it sooner. In my opinion, we saw it sooner with Hannah because she was the narrator. Mm -hmm. But what's your take on that? What's my take on it? Or is this yeah. a group for a question for the group? Um, you know, again, I think it was pretty, pretty slow, you know? Um, and uh, I think that's a really good question. I'm not sure if there was a moment. I think that they just liked each other from the start. I mean, I think Jack admired her and thought she was awesome from the minute she flipped him. Yes. Yeah. You know, yeah. Like, yeah. that was the moment when she that got- That was like foreplay for them. Yeah, that was, yeah. yeah. Well, that was the moment <laughs> when he suddenly realized that she was, there was a lot more to her than met the eye, you yeah. know? Um, and so I think he loved that idea. He loved how competent she was and he loved um, how like she just knew what she was doing. She was just she was like a tough guy and he really liked that about her. And that is, of course, the thing she likes best about herself. So they kind of found this sort of common ground. Mm -hmm. And of course, Jack Stapleton, she thought he was cute even before she met him. Right. Like right. she'd seen him in movies and. Um, oh, yeah. So she came in with this weird sort of front loaded set of memories of him that were not reciprocated because she had seen them all, you know, in movies and TV. So that was a little odd. And so for her, it was this process of 
getting to know the real guy rather than the the character characters that she'd seen exactly and you know for me like i mean i could go back through it and really think about it but what pops to mind when you say that question for me with hannah is when she almost when she falls into the river and he pulls her out and yells at her yeah and then um that whole moment there where he's so worried and angry and there's so much intensity it just kind of takes things up to an another level but then when it all sort of wraps up with him you know putting his jacket on her and then putting her on his back and carrying her back yeah. all the ranch i see that moment very vividly because 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 um the ranch and the bodyguard is a real place yeah it's your family's ranch right it's my family's real ranch and so um you know i have spent my entire life going down there when i was little it was my grandparents place and then they both passed away and my mom now runs it um and uh we still go down there every thanksgiving you know it's a working cattle ranch and so you know my whole childhood i went down to the brazos river and i you know walked that very lane and i can see it in my mind you know and so for me you know i was writing this book during the pandemic okay it was my it was my pandemic book. i was writing this book during the weirdest scariest Mm -hmm. you know, most unsettling parts of the pandemic kind of right near the beginning and then onward. And, you know, I don't know how y'all were doing during the pandemic, but I was not feeling super optimistic for humanity. I was like, we're definitely all going to die. Like this is like, there's no way this is going to end well. Right. I felt very discouraged from the outset. I was like, this is not going to be good. And, you know, every night at I would like be like pulling back the covers, you know, across from my husband, we'd be pulling back the covers for bed. And I would just look at him and I'd be like, I want you to know that I have really enjoyed being married to you. You know, <laughs> I'd be like, I really, you know, it's been the great honor and privilege of my life to be married to you. And I, you know, uh, we're definitely going to be dead tomorrow. So right. um, thank you for your nice mother, knowing you. So. Yeah. I was so I was not feeling optimistic. And then yet, right, yet faced with all of this pessimism and this creepiness and all the weird stuff that was going on, then I also still had a book to write. And so I had to sort of ask myself this question of like, okay, it's the end of civilization, right? What book am I going to write in the face of that, right? And I decided that I would write the sweetest, swooniest, most sunshiny, most hilarious, most warm-hearted romantic comedy that I could possibly write. And so, in fact, of you know, I was talking earlier about how like I tend to create my books in this sort of balance between like struggle and hardship for the main character and and like a swoony love story and try to have both. I really minimized struggle and hardship in The Bodyguard because I just kind of felt like, aren't we all struggling enough? Like, aren't we all going through enough? Like, I just decided, you know what? Do I have to torture the main character? Like, we're good on the personal growth right now. And I just decided to write something fun and, and light. It was really how I made my own sunshine during the pandemic. Well, what I liked about Hannah is that a lot of times when writers, um, when authors will create a character they are so antagonistic that you're just you know you're like god what is wrong with you girl like you know get over yourself or stop doing that or why do you keep doing that and i think she was i think hannah was very good at acknowledging things areas that she needed to grow and things that she needed to put behind her and so you may it you made hannah lovable likable yeah, she's not, I mean, she is a tough guy in certain ways, but she's also very tender in mm -hmm. other ways, right? Like, and she, like, there's one point in the story when Jack says, you know, I think the thing about all that toughness is that you kind of created it to protect the tenderness, mm. paraphrasing, but it's something like that. But, you know, I, I love that about her too, right? She's she's tried to, she, you know, she faced a lot of hard stuff growing up, a lot of scary stuff. And this was kind of her way of trying to grow up to be a strong person. And I felt like what Hannah really, really needed was like a safe, a safe place in her life or, or safe people, right? Where she could sort of relax for like the first time ever. And so, you know, I love to have a character 
who thinks they need a thing and then take that thing away from the character and not mm -hmm. let them have it, right? And so for her, her thing was her career, right? She was very, very good at her job. And she loved that her career let her travel all over the world and she didn't have to stay home. She could escape, you know, she could always be on the move, always seeing new things, new places, new people, right? Never kind of stagnating or having to sit around and like, look at her life. She could always be onto the next thing, onto the next thing. And then, you know, what happens at the start of this book is that her, her mom dies and she gets grounded, right? Because her boss, Glenn, decides that she needs to grieve. And so she gets stuck. All she wants to do is leave Escape. town, right? Mm -hmm. Get back to work, move on, not think about it. But instead she gets kind of grounded. She has to go to this ranch and she gets stuck with these people where she can't even do her job properly because she's stuck in this funny sort of fake dating situation where she has to seem not like a bodyguard, but like, um, like a girlfriend. And so instead of doing all her normal coping mechanisms, she, they're all sort of stripped away from her. And all she can do is like hang out with uh, Connie, right? And like, and like cook dinner and like walk around, like jog around on the ranch. And it, it, she just doesn't have any of her normal things. And when that happens, it kind of cracks her open a little bit. And this, this fun, sweet, complicated family is able to kind of get at her in a way that her clients never ordinarily would. Yeah, I loved her. I loved um, uh, Jack's parents. Yeah. Yeah, were, were your parents a lot like your parents were his were his parents i mean is any of this and this is another question when you were writing this do we do we pull back the curtain on a little bit of your life i know that the ranch is in, is real you talked about how writing for you as a young woman kind of helped you cope with your awkwardness so what else is in there that is catherine the comedy mm -hmm. the banter um, that's all me. I mean, you know, my husband is the funniest person I've ever met. And we, you know, the Venn diagram of things that he is interested in, in the world and the things that I am interested in the world is like two separate circles. Like there's no overlap at all between what he's interested in and what I am, except for joking around. Like he is very funny and I'm funny. And our favorite thing to do is to sit around and joke around and crack each other up. Like that's that's what we do. And we do it all day long. We do it all the time. And so um, I have also two very funny kids. I mean, our dog is probably even funny if she could talk. I mean, everybody's <laughs> funny in our family. So we do a lot of comedy. We use comedy as coping mechanisms for all mm -hmm. kinds of like stresses and life, you know, worries. And uh, it is like joking around, making people laugh and laughing myself is my favorite thing to do. And so, um, yeah, the, uh, everything anybody funny says in The Bodyguard or in any of my books is is either something that pops into my head while I was writing or something someone in my family has actually said. Yeah. Um, so that so that's very much me. And I would say that with all the characters, they're a, they're partly me, right? Because the t I'm not a tough guy at all. I'm like the tenderest. I'm like the most tender hearted person you've ever met. Like if you just give me a dirty look in the grocery store, I will like burst into tears and go home and like curl up on the couch under a fuzzy blanket. Like I am not tough at all. So what's fun is every time I write a story, um, the narrator, you know, they're always written in the first person. So I'm sort of, I'm writing, I'm like talking for that Right. Character, right. Yeah. And so they always become, it's like they're them, right? Like Hannah is a bodyguard. I did a ton of research about that job. I had a whole sense of her as a person that is separate from me. But then it's like I'm kind of telling her story for her and I'm telling it the way I would tell it if it happened to me. And I'm thinking about it the way I would think about it if I were her and it had happened to me, you know? So it's the way that she's kind of self aware. That's very much me. I'm constantly like, why did I do that? That was weird. You know, like, yeah. so she's got a lot of me in that way. And all my main characters do. Okay. So you gave me a heart attack on page 299 <laughs> when you said, and I'm, I'm, this is Hannah talking, though I should mention. So it, basically everything has happened. This is in the epilogue. Okay. Okay. You know, you always want to know what happens at the end. And I know you said on your website, you would never kill the main character in a car accident or a bus accident. You would never do that to your readers. Right. So you did do this, though I should mention that Jack and I aren't dating anymore. 
And I thought, oh, I can't date a guy like that, like Jack forever. And I thought, oh my gosh, <laughs> they split up. And then I kept reading and you got them married, which was just wonderful. Yeah. That's like a little, that's like a little mini twist. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. I loved it. I loved it. Do you have a, do you have a copy of your book around? I wanted you to read something. Yeah. Hang on one second. Don't y'all love her wallpaper? Yes. Oh, so pretty. It's beautiful. I painted that. So you did? Mm -hmm. oh. Yeah. That was um, when we were, right when the pandemic happened, I had a book tour that got canceled and I knew I was going to be doing a lot of Zooming. So um, I made it. It's, you know, those little trifold boards that little kids use yes. um, to make science experiments, yes. you know? Mm -hmm. um, that's what, the, it's two of them sort of on top of each other. So it makes a little tall background. And um, I just laid it out on the dining table and painted some flowers. I just wanted it to feel festive, you know, cause it's I was not fun. feeling festive. So I thought. No. And it <laughs> reminds me a lot of the cover art on your book. Do you have any say in that? Um, yes, yes and no. I mean, there's a, there's a designer at Macmillan named Olga Grilich who does all the covers for me. Um, and it's really her concept and her stuff, but she's very lovely and thoughtful about, you know, letting me jump in and have opinions. And I love, and the flowers were actually my idea because, um, in how to walk away, the main character has gotten, um, third degree burns on mm -hmm. her shoulder and her neck. And at the end of the story, she's had these skin grafts. And at the end of the story, she gets them tattooed with flowers. Oh, and it's this, it's this tiny little part of the epilogue, actually. It's just this tiny little mention. Yeah. But um, but it stuck in my head. And when we were sort of brainstorming ideas for what the um cover might be, I was like, well, maybe it's maybe it's an airplane. You know, the airplane is sort of how the story starts. If you read the story, she's in a plane crash at the very beginning. Um, and then the flowers are kind of how the story ends, right? Her life is kind of graced with flowers in all kinds of ways. And so I thought, well, maybe it's something with a plane and flowers. And then um, Olga came up with this gorgeous cover, this red cover with this airplane and these flowers all over it. And ever since then, we've run with the flower idea. Like we just put everything now. And I love it. I love it. I love and it. her name is Olga Kravich? Uh, Grillich. G -R Grillich. G -R -L -I -C -E. At any point, did she make you do jumping jacks or because she sounds like a German, um, one of those German exercise enthusiasts that you would see on old videos? No, she's nothing like that. She's, <laughs> she's, she's lovely and she's beautiful. She's gorgeous. I met her at um, at the office one day and I just hugged her and I wouldn't let go because I was so grateful mm -hmm. for all the beautiful covers she's made for me. She's absolutely adorable. That's wonderful. OK, so on page 259, if you could start with um i was fine it's kind of maybe a third of the way down i'm gonna switch to stronger glasses i'm at this phase of my life now 259 okay i was fine with yeah and how long do you want me to go for um till the bottom okay well until until you get to your that quote that's so powerful which i think you know what it is a choice to decide who you are. Okay. Okay. Um, I was fine with caring as long as it was mutual, but was it? It had seemed more than mutual yesterday when he was pressing me up against the wall in his parents' hallway. Which was a super hot scene, by the way. <laughs> well, I'll say. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but yesterday was a million years ago. I wondered if the triple punch of it all, losing my mom, then losing Robbie, then losing Taylor, had left a bigger scar than I'd realized. Was I lovable? I mean, are any of us really lovable if you overthink it? It was tempting to chicken out. But then I thought of Jack going walk, walk, walk. And I wondered if having faith in yourself was just deciding you could do it, whatever it was, and then making yourself follow through. So I decided something right then. Every chance you take is a choice, a choice to decide who you are. Yeah, I love that. Mm -hmm. 
Is there yeah, in fact, at one point I thought this book might be called Every Chance You Take. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, but it did not wind up with that title. And so um, that's a good question. Do you start, do you have a title in mind before you start writing the book or you have a concept and then the title comes after that? Um, it varies quite a bit depending on the book. Um, sometimes I have no idea. And even up until the very last minute, my editor and I are emailing titles to each other in the middle of the night. Like, what about this? Um, I, you know, there have been books where I've come up with brainstormed a hundred titles, you know, just this could work, this could work, this could work. Usually when I'm writing, I don't know the title and I have, um, I just keep a, like a running list in one of the notebooks that I'm using, um, like a, on a back page that I can find easily of like anything. And there's a certain point, honestly, when anything starts to sound like a book title too, it's like, let's go to the grocery store. And you're like, that could be the title. Wait. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Yeah. And that, uh, but, but um, with some of them, like Things You Save in a Fire was a very last minute title. I mean, we were oh. brainstorming all kinds of fire related sayings and ideas, and it was really, really hard to find the right thing. And then the minute that we landed on Things You Save in a Fire, we were like, that's it. That's the one. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, the Bodyguard had a different working title, and it's funny because I can't remember what it is right now. Um, but I sent it in with a different title and um, they, my editor loved the book, but she wrote me back and she was like, what do you think about this idea? What do you think of the bodyguard? And I immediately wrote back and was like, I love it. You know, I was like making dinner. I was like stirring spaghetti on the stove and this email came in and I wrote back and was like, I love it. And then after I sent the email, I stopped and I was like, wait, wasn't that a movie in the 90s? Right. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, how, did you get around, how did you get around that? Well, you can't copyright a title. So okay. there's no, you know, so you can do any title you ever want to. Um, but uh, I worried that it would just be confusing for people. And it has been a little bit, I mean, there's certainly been a lot of discussion. There, it's been funny to see the reviews that pop up and say, you know, this isn't your mama's bodyguard or like uh, people saying, you know, Captain Center has updated the 1990s classic. I'm like, oh no, no, no. I was not even thinking about the 1990s mm -hmm. classic when I was writing the book. But um, but I love the title. I mean, it's really simple, right? It kind of gets right to wow. the heart of it. And I think people do, um, it is kind of a fun surprise because I think most people seem to assume that he's going to be the bodyguard. Right. And then they jump in and find out that it's her. And that is a kind of twist on things. I don't, you don't have a lot of women bodyguard books out there. So that was just a fun little. Yeah, that's a great one. Different. Point. Okay, so I know um, our time is getting toward the end. I wanted you to talk about a couple of other projects. You've got Hello Stranger. You're going to be launching your book tour for that. Yeah. And then Happiness for Beginners is going to be, as we said, it's going to be a Netflix. So tell us a little bit about Hello Stranger. What's that about? So Hello Stranger is adorable. Um, and it's a story about a woman who is a portrait artist. That's her job. And she's like a failed portrait artist. Like she's not making any money. She's not at all thriving. You know, she's broke. She's living in a sort of hovel um, on a rooftop that really should be like a storage area. It's not even like a real apartment. And um, she's she's been trying and trying and trying to um, make it. And she hasn't gotten anywhere. This may sound familiar to you guys um, because I also tried and tried and tried for many years to make it and <laughs> yeah, did not right. get anywhere. So I really love, I really love stories about downtrodden, struggling, struggling and not getting anywhere. And um, as the story starts, she gets her big break, which is that she places in a portrait competition um, that is really prestigious and really hard to place in. And so, uh, um, you know, I'm looking at this screen. It looks like everybody froze. Are you guys all still there? Oh yeah, yeah. we can totally yeah. still hear you. Yeah. Okay, I can't see, everybody's frozen. All the pictures are frozen, but that's okay. As long as you can hear me. Yeah. Um, so she, uh, she, she places in this portrait competition and then right as that happens, she has a kind of a weird medical situation that winds up causing her to get a very rare but real real life condition called face blindness uh-huh and face Ooh. blindness is a real thing in the world yeah. and um, 
yeah, it's where you can see, you can see everything, you can see just fine, but the one thing that you your brain cannot make sense of or process is human faces. And, mm. that's, and that's real because there is a little tiny sort of pea-sized area in your brain kind of behind your ear that processes faces and it's very specialized. And if it gets damaged or has a problem, then you can't see faces right. And basically what, and it, there are two different kinds of face blindness. I could go all night. It's super fascinating. But the kind that she has is like, she can see the faces, but it's like they're puzzle pieces that won't connect. Mm. She, can, she can see that there are eyes. She can see there's a nose. She can see there's a mouth, but they don't snap together into what she recognizes as a face. And um, actually, if you're ever bored, you can go on my website because one of the ways that they test your facial recognition abilities in sort of clinical settings is they they take pictures of famous faces and they take the hair off like they crop it very tightly in an oval and um and they see if you can recognize people without their hair and another thing they'll do to give you a sense of what it's like to not be able to make sense of a face is turn the pictures upside down Mm. And so I have a little graphic on my website where it's all these famous people who you would totally recognize if they had their hair and were right side up, but they're upside down. And it, even I, and I made the graphic, even I will look at the pictures and be like, wait, who is that again? Like you can't, there's not that like snap of recognition. So, you know, yeah. when I was talking about in my stories, um, characters have to struggle with something. This is the thing that she is struggling with in the story. She's trying to figure out, like she's just gotten her big break. And all of a sudden she cannot rely on all of her normal ways of doing things. And she has to kind of rethink her life, rethink how we see people, you know, rethink what it even means to see somebody, right? And try and solve this problem in a different way. So that's kind of the challenge of the story. And how can she paint a portrait for this competition when she can't see faces? Sure. And then the, other, the other half of it that's really super fun is that um, there's a little love triangle. She she actually, in this moment of crisis in her life, she falls in love with two different guys at the same time. And she's fully aware that it's probably just her creating drama for herself because life is so weird right now and she just needs something fun to look forward to. But she's got a very cute veterinarian who saves the life of her dog. Mm -hmm. um, and then she's got this neighbor in her building who keeps helping her out in these crazy moments when she least expects it. And um, so I've never really written a love triangle before. And this one was really, really fun to do. And I think it's very swoony. Um, <laughs> and that's the story. I think it's I think it's a great love story. And I think that the medical component of it is really, really fascinating. And I did a ton, mm -hmm. a ton, a ton of research um, to learn as much about it all as I possibly could before writing this story. And I just, everything about it is fascinating to me. And so one last question, since you, you seem to be very swoony over this book, books are like children, I would guess. <laughs> What's been your favorite book you've ever written besides oh. the Duran Duran book? Um, well, that's so hard. I, I mean, I love them all in, in different ways. I will say just, to be honest, I think I am getting better as I go along. And um, by better, I mean, when I started out, I didn't really know what I was doing. You know, I I wanted to write good stories, but I, I didn't really know what good even meant. And I was kind of using like my writing teacher's compass for what that meant when I was younger. It was kind of, I was kind of using like an external metric to kind of define that. And mm -hmm. I think the reason that I've gotten better over all these years as I've gotten older and wiser is that um, I've moved from trying to imagine what somebody else would think was good into my own internal compass, you know, where like you, if you're a writer, I think the only book you can really write is the book that you yourself would want to read if you had like a free Saturday and a fuzzy blanket and a hot cup of tea, what would you want to read? And right. this, these are the books. The books I'm writing now are exactly the books I want to read. I want to laugh. I want to cry a little bit. You know, I want my heart a little bit broken. I, I want to um, fall madly in love. You know, I want to learn things. I want to be challenged. I want to shift the way I think about the world. You know, there are so many things that I'm looking for and the, the clearer and clearer I get in my own 
head about what I love in a story, the better I am at like creating that in service for other people. So yeah. I do think I'm better as I go along. So if you, you know, sometimes people want to go back and read all my books and they're like, oh, I'm going to go start at the beginning. And I'm like, no, no, no. Start at the end. <laughs> work your way backwards because they're better at the end than they were at the beginning. But you can, it's all the same. You can see the same comedy is there, the same banter is there. But I'm just much, much clearer about what I love in a story. And I'm better at doing that for the other people who also love that same stuff. Um, one I, know cool I did want to tell you guys about I did want to tell you guys about happiness for beginners because it comes yes. out July 27th. It opens on um Netflix. So you could just oh. you know, flip on Netflix, you know, on the 27th. Oh, no. You don't even have to leave the house. And I did uh, read your book, Your oh, Happiness you. for Beginners. I've read two more of your books since The Bodyguard. Oh, thank you. I really like them. Um uh, well them. I'm I'm in Happiness for Beginners also for like one second. I got to be an extra in the movie and I got to go to the wedding of my own main character and I got to stand in the background and uh, pretend to drink champagne with Blythe Danner. Who's oh, really? <laughs> it was very <laughs> cool. Definitely a wow. high of my life. She was lovely. Um, so yeah, that's coming out on the 27th and I'm, and, um, Hello Stranger comes out on July 11th and then I go on a big book tour for that and I come home and the very next day, um, the movie comes out. So it's going to be a super busy, uh, July in my You're life. going to be Fort Worth on July 23rd? I am going to Fort Worth. Yay! Most of us are in Fort Worth. Oh, I didn't even know that. Well, come yes. see this. Monkey and Dog. That's amazing. Okay. I read it at 2 o'clock Sunday, July 23rd. And uh, Monkey and Dog is like not a huge place, but I'm also it. right around there. I'm also going to be, I'm going to the big half price books in Dallas, which is has so much space. So if Monkey and Dog is full, go to Dallas or Waco. The, Waco has the cutest bookstore in, you've ever seen. It's called Fabled Bookshop and it's adorable. It is. So, yeah. Yeah. Come see, come see me. It'll be awesome. Um, and I also want to encourage you if you if you haven't already to join my mailing list because um, I won't spam you I promise but I I send out these very fun cheerful delightful emails like four times a year and you know I think of it as like sunshine for your inbox so definitely <laughs> give it a try and if you sign up and you're just getting too many emails and it's not working it's totally fine you can unsubscribe I'll never know I don't even look it won't hurt my feelings we'll still be good. Awesome. Okay, so after you get done with your, your worldwide tour on that, are you starting another book? So I just, on Wednesday, I should I should mention this, thank you for reminding me, turned in my t summer 2024 book. Wow. So I was writing that all last year and it's now done. And um, yeah, it'll come out next summer and it's it's actually a connected story to The Bodyguard. Ooh, okay. Hey. All right. Oh, that's a tease. Yeah, it's it's I'm madly in love with it right now. It's so much fun. So the main sort of the love interest main guy in this new book that I've just written is a screenwriter. And he is the screenwriter who wrote the movie that made Jack Stapleton famous. OK. Oh. And um, he and Jack are actually kind of friends. Mm -hmm. And uh, so Jack actually has a little cameo in the mm. Okay. <laughs> There's a moment when we all get to see Jack again, which is fun. And we hope that in uh, if Robbie went off in the sunset, got fired, and he's on, you know, he's in the poorhouse <laughs> now and has yeah, no girl. Yeah, we won't be seeing Robbie again. I mean, unless it's some kind of crazy redemption story, he's he's not going to be. I mean, up. what a jerk. Yeah. <laughs> and I love how, how Jack would call him like Roddy or Bobby. Bobby. Or Bobby. Bobby. <laughs> Yeah, deliberately getting his name wrong is a beautiful yeah. power move. I loved it. I know. I love that. Um, a woman at a bookstore called Blue Willow Bookshop in Houston, right after she read The Bodyguard, she said, you are really great at writing jackasses. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, you know, you're right, actually. I don't know if that's a blessing or a curse. And she was like, well, it's a blessing for me because I think it's really fun to read about them. Yeah. Does anybody have any, a quick question for Catherine before we sign off for tonight? That we didn't cover. Thank you so much. Oh, so I, fun. Thank you. You're delightful. I have a question. Yeah. Yes, Gina. I have, I have a question. So, um, do you have a favorite way or a way that really works well for you to develop your book? Like you, you come up with the idea and then you do your outline, 
um, that you could share with us? Sure, sure, sure. Um, yeah, so uh, it's different every time, I have to say. Okay. Um, it's a very, you know, it's a very circular process. It's not, it's it's not like um, there's no formula for it for me. You know, I'm always okay. kind of working my way through the wilderness trying to figure it out. But but some things that I do really rely on every time are I do a ton of research, okay. and I find that research makes you more sure-footed in where you're going with the story because now that you've learned how it would happen it's easier to kind of move forward with the story that way, but also it gives you a lot of ideas, right? Yeah. So it's very inspiring to do research. So I, I do a ton of research in part because I don't want to get it wrong, but in part because it really helps me figure out even what the story is. Yeah. Okay. Um, and what I typically do is I do like a ton of research at the very beginning. I fill up notebooks and notebooks full of notes. And then, you know, in the writing world, they have a term for it. There's plotters and pantsers. And plotters are people who plot everything out in advance, like make an outline. And then pantsers are people who write by the seat of their pants, right? <laughs> yeah. And so they just kind of get in there and figure it out as they go. And I'm a hybrid between those things because I always do want to try and have a sense of where I'm going because I never ever want to go off on a tangent that's not useful, you know? And that can happen. If you don't know where you're going, then you don't know what needs to be there. You don't know what the journey yeah. is. Yeah. But I also find that as I'm writing, the scene that just happened tells me a lot about the scene that's going to happen next. So I kind of always have an idea about what I want to do, but then I also really try to respect the story kind of guiding me if we go in a different direction or we need to do something else. Okay. So I... Yeah, so I, those are things. The other thing that I will really say, and this is always my biggest advice to people who are writing, um, is you have to learn to practice the art of self-encouragement. Meaning, I think all of us who want to write are very good at tearing ourselves down, mm -hmm. right? And like saying, oh, that's not working, or oh, that's so boring, or oh, another cliche, I've got to rip out you know, we can all see what we're doing wrong. And that's, that's fine. That's a, that's a skill you have to have too. But I would encourage you to try and balance that as much as you can with noticing what you're doing right. Okay. Right. When you write something good, enjoy it, be proud of it, like focus on it, say to yourself, Oh, that's good. That's working. Like go read it to somebody, go read it to a friend and say, I just wrote this amazing, beautiful line or this funny little piece of dialogue. And um, like savor it, you know, when it's working, because what mm -hmm. I really, really believe and, and, and let me back up, do that also with other people's stories, right? Like read other people's work and admire, like pay attention to what, what you love about that stuff. Like I think okay. I really think that love what you love in your own work and in other people's work is the thing that's going to guide you forward. Right. Okay. And this, this is the thing that I've really come to understand about if you're teaching yourself to do any creative thing at all, is that you're never going to be able to show yourself the path of where you want to go by looking at what you don't like, right? Or by looking at the stuff that isn't working for you. So it, when you read a book, it's so ten, it's so it's such a strong tendency to want to say, "I didn't like this," you know, or her dialogue was so wooden. You know, you can you can rip somebody else's book to pieces all day long. But I think that's not the way to get better. The way to get better is to go through other people's work and your own and look for what got you, you know, okay. what worked, what made you tear up, what made you laugh, what, what made a really vivid image in your mind. That's the stuff to pay attention to is what's working. Okay. And that, that that's how you learn how to write that guides you forward more than any workshop right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> more than any like lecture you might go to more than like me on your computer, like talking about stories. It's, it's going deep in inside your own heart and your own sort of inner reader's perspective and okay. paying attention to what you yourself love in stories, your own and everybody else's and just surrounding yourself with that and following that. Okay. That's better. That's my oh. best advice. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Plus, it's a lot more fun that way, too. Yeah. <laughs> it's been so fun to have you tonight. Thank you so much for 
donating your time to us tonight. We had such a great time getting to know you and learning more about your writing process. And we look forward to the happiness project and hello stranger. Yeah. Yes. And thank you guys for having me. I was such a treat and I hope I will see y'all somewhere in Dallas, Fort Worth or Waco in, you know, a month or so. That would be okay. wonderful. Everybody stay well. Thanks for joining us and I'll see you next month. Miss you, Melissa. Bye. Bye, bye. Thank you. See you bye. soon. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Oh, I don't know what that does. Oh, I did hang up. <laughs>